It is July 1945, and all seems calm at Farm Hall, Godmanchester, England. Some new guests are at the house, and they are settling into what feels like a nice bit of English country luxury. The men, however, rather strangely for the time, being welcomed into the building, are German. And not just any Germans. They were, just a few years earlier, a vital part of the German war machine. So why are they in the relative luxury of their once enemy's countryside? Well, they are scientists, and they are prisoners of war. Clearly not all POWs after the fall of Germany in the Second World War were housed in such comfortable surroundings. They are to be interrogated by the British to try and find out what they had been up to during the past few years of the war. The men are known informally as the Uranium Club, and its lead was Werner Karl Heisenberg. But we aren't here for a rundown of their six-month interrogation at Farm Hall. We're actually here for a nuclear disaster. The first disaster involving a nuclear reactor in human history. You see, the Uranium Club had been building a nuclear weapons program, and part of this was in a city called Leipzig. Today we're looking at the LV4 experiment disaster. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today's video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you want early access to the channel's videos, then you can from just £1 per month. As always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. The German Pursuit of Nuclear it's probably not a shock to anyone, but all of the major players in the 1930s were chasing the splitting of the atom, and Germany was no exception. This was unofficially called the Uranium Verum, or Uranium Project. Beginning not long after the discovery of nuclear fission in 1938 by Otto Fran Hitz-Straussmann, Lisa Meitner, and Otto Robert Thirsch. The discovery would pave the way for nuclear power and atomic weapons, Happening just before the outbreak of the war, the discovery managed to make it to the United States. The German nuclear efforts would quickly be stunted after the invasion of Poland, when men in the scientific community were pressed into service in the Wehrmacht. The drafted scientists were moved to a German army-led nuclear weapons program in the Heerswaffenemt. The Germans' weapons program was split into three sections. The uranium machine, or also known as nuclear reactor development, which is the main focus for our video today, materials production, i.e. uranium and vital heavy water, and uranium isotope separation. However, the project was slated to take at least five years before any usable weapon could be created. And because of this, in 1942, the project was very fragmented, with each department doing its own research to its own set of goals, and in relative isolation from one another. In order to research potential critical assemblies, four uranium machines would be tested at the Physics Institute in the University of Leipzig. They would be named L1 to L4 and were built to Heisenberg's theoretical work and tested by Robert Doppel. The test reactors were spherical, again following Heisenberg's theory. At one point, there was even another experimental pile at the University of Heidelberg. This was 4 tonnes of uranium oxide and 435 kilograms of water mixed in an earthenware vat. But that wasn't the only one. Another pile was also planned to be built in Berlin around 1940 and was designated the B pile. This was again a cylindrical shape but was loaded with layers of uranium oxide, and interestingly having a paraffin as its moderator. A chain reaction was not observed here, even when the union uranium content was increased. Meanwhile, in Leipzig, tests with the first two uranium machines, i.e. L1 and L2, were undertaken. These used uranium oxide and light water on L1, but 164 kilograms of heavy water was used in L2. L3 was assembled by Doppel and used 160 kilograms of heavy water and 140 kilograms of uranium oxide in two layers within a 75 centimeter aluminium sphere. And again, no increase in neutrons was found, but the Leipzig team continued on. And this leads us on to the LV4. Don't worry, we are getting closer to a disaster. 
L4. The next part of the project was the L4, and it began in May 1942. The L4 pile used the same sphere principle style, with pure uranium powder, weighing at 750 kilograms with 140 kilograms of heavy water. These contents were placed within two aluminium hemispheres bolted together, with a diameter of around 80 centimetres. The whole assembly was submerged in a bath of light water for neutron reflection and for a kind of biological shield. In the centre of the assembly was a neutron source injection channel, in which a beryllium starter source would be inserted. At the top of the reactor vessel, there was a vacuum. This allowed for thermal expansion of the heavy water. But those of you who have seen nuclear reactor-based videos on the channel before might have noticed something a little bit absent. That is, any form of radioactivity control, if a chain reaction would ever to take place. Thus, there was no real way to shut down the pile if it got started. During the 20 or so days that the L4 was active, the scientists noticed that the pile was beginning to emit more neutrons at the pile's surface than just what the source itself would have emitted. It looked like the pile was starting to work. However, scientists working on the pile saw bubbling water at the top seal, and this was hinting at a potential leak. This was June the 23rd of 1945. Operators were ordered to open up the pile, bearing in mind that the reactor had no criticality controls. When the pile was opened up, air was sucked in from the vacuum at the top of the pile. The air, most notably the oxygen in the air, reacted with the hydrated uranium powder. Quickly, the mixture ignited and temperatures within the pile sped up to nearly 1000 degrees centigrade. This ended up boiling the water inside the sphere and the light water reflector. A massive self-deconstruction of the pile followed, shooting boiling water and burning uranium powder up into the air by several meters. Multiple smaller explosions and fires would continue on for two more days after the accident, in doing so destroying the building and the pile that was situated within it. The human cost is very vague. Reportedly no one was killed by the accident, although some other reports have had the death toll up to four. One thing that is certain though is that the event probably caused longer term conditions from the exposure, although tracking this is next to impossible due to the historical period. But the damage to the German weapons program was much further reaching. The aftermath. Now the explosion was not just the loss of the pile, but a loss of the very valuable uranium and just as vital heavy water. It would set back the disjointed program. The pile experiments at Leipzig were cancelled. Instead, further pile experiments would take place at the Berlin campus. But although a catastrophic unexpected uranium conflagration, the L4 had proved that net neutron production could be achieved in the German project. The efforts in Berlin would be continued to be wasted by the German war to turn against it. Another experimental pile, the Hegelot Research Reactor, did achieve a chain reaction from neutron bombardment of uranium, but it did not achieve criticality. This happened just in the closing days of World War II. The German nuclear reactor program would abruptly end when US soldiers ended up turning up and deconstructed and shipped off the reactor to the USA for investigations towards the end of April 1945. Now this leads us back to Farm Hall in England, between the 1st of May and 30th of June 1945. Many of the higher up ranking scientists of the German nuclear program had been captured. Ten were transferred to the UK for interrogations. During this time, the world's first nuclear reactor disaster came to light, as the scientists were bugged at Farm Hall and their conversations were overheard. Interestingly, they were very ignorant to the US nuclear program, as when they were told of the more successful deployment of atomic weapons over Japan, many showed complete disbelief. They were a long way off building a nuclear weapon, but at least they did get one first in nuclear history. And although this would not, as we all know, be the last nuclear reactor accident to ever occur. So that's my video on the world's first nuclear reactor disaster. I know I'm no Mark Felton, but my rating is going to be a 1 on the, on the disaster scale, and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below.
This and Plain Different Production, all videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Different videos are produced by me, John, in a currently quite warm corner of Southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching, and Mr. Music, play us out, please.